Thank you very much, and welcome to Lecture C in this series under Public Health Considerations of Diversity, Equity, and Inequality. Um, I hope that you are enjoying the uh, module thus far. Um, this is the last lecture in um, my block um, for this particular subject matter, um, and we let's go ahead and get started. Now, as you recall, um, we um, ended up on case three. So in this block, Lecture C, we're going to do three additional cases, three short cases, um, under the environmental justice theme. This first case is from Nashville, Tennessee. And of course, I um, have put up the uh, learning objectives here, as you'll see. Um, now, of course, this is the last in a series of three. And so in totality, with respect to the learning objectives, I'd like you to be able to understand how all of the combined environmental exposure, um, exposures that we've been over impact disease processes, okay? And I'd also like for you to have an appreciation for how the socioeconomic and behavioral factors that we've discussed thus far as part of the public health exposome paradigm um, interact and impact um, disease progression, if you will, leading to those disparate health outcomes that we um, have been um, discussing and that we will discuss further in this module. You will notice that uh, this next learning objective involves public participatory geographical information systems so I'd like you to pay attention and sort of learn how PPGIS can be used to help to transform high-risk and vulnerable communities, okay? This will be toward a collective efficacy for the residents. And lastly, I'd, I'd like for you to understand um, and be able to discuss somewhat in the group sessions that we'll hold at the end of the module discuss how to promote these bi-directional communication and interactions between academicians, local, um, state, and policy makers, and of course with um, the relevant stakeholders as well, okay? And that's toward this very nice collaboration that you see in one of those readings that I assigned, okay? And so, as I indicated, um, here we are in Nashville, um, Tennessee, this um, uh, is a study that was done um, during my 20 year stint there um, uh, in a, an environmental justice community, which is located just outside of the Meharry Medical College campus, okay? And as you see here, um, this is one of those, um, this is one of the publications on the cover. Um, here is the actual um, front page there, and here, this is involving um, de developing um, and actually um, administering, followed by calibration of calibrating a survey, okay? A 54 questionnaire environmental exposure survey. Now this survey was meant to um, sort of um, gather uh, one's perceptions to exposure to um, environmental contaminants. So it's perceptions of environmental exposures. And, and to this end, um, we set forth a couple of hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that, number one, can a 54-item environmental contaminant exposure survey be developed, validated, calibrated, and tested for the purposes of identifying vulnerable high-risk populations that are in close proximity to sources of environmental pollution. We did have a secondary um, hypothesis, but we don't have time to get into that today, all right? And of course, the study design in this um, Nashville, Tennessee um, study was as follows. As you can see here, our target goal was and in of about 184 respondents. And um, of course, we wanted to sort of assess their perceptions 
of exposure, and this is within the context of the public health expose zone, those five domains that we spoke to you about. Those five domains of the expose zone, remember, we said that the expose zone is where you live, work, play, and pray, right? And so that includes, the first here, you see home and hobby, right? Um, the school, yes, the community, and of course, one is concerned with occupational exposures at work, and of course, your predisposition. That would entail your exposure history, all right? So we conducted interviews on childbearing age minority women who visited the subspecialty clinics at the Nashville General um, Hospital, and that's the Hos teaching hospital of Meharry Medical College. And the innovative part of the study was that um, as compared to logistic regression, we wanted to get into a um, learning methodology, right? Um, support vector machines, right? This is iterative learning by the computer, okay? So let's see if logistic regression compares to um, SVM modeling, and that was the purpose and, and, and study design there. Of course, our target um, outcome variable of interest was uh, zip code, uh, not necessarily census tracts or census blocks, but um, responding to zip code would be sufficient for this particular study. Now, the zip code is important because we're going to assess the proximity of the respondent's zip code um, and where they live to um, toxic release inventory facilities that may be um, uh, in and around um, the area, okay? And of course, this just shows the rest of the process. We don't have time to go through this today, but suffice it to say that this was an IRB approved um, study. There was also some neurodevelopment and event-related potential testing um, on the infants that were born, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this particular lecture today, all right? If anyone wants to know about that, you can um, see me after the lecture or come by my office and participate in some of the events and activities that my laboratory um, is engaged in, and I'll be happy to share that with you. And so here are the variable descriptions, and I just uh, indicated to you that the um, outcome variable of interest here, shown here with zip codes, these are all the zip codes in um, the immediate area of Metro Davidson County, um, Tennessee, but more interesting, and for the purposes of this discussion, look at the um, independent variables. And so the questionnaire contained um, various questions. You see uh, block over to the right of the question. That would represent the response rate of the individual um, independent variables. And so as you see here, one of them, question six, was do you live near a polluted lake or stream? Question 17A, do you use pesticides in or around your home? Question 17C, of course, do you use pesticides on your lawn and garden, of course? Question 24A, is there carpeted, is there carpet in the classrooms um, of your children's school? Okay, that then would be uh, nitroxide type of exposure. Um, question 24E, does your child's school have windows that are actually open? Okay. Question 24F. Do you notice a moldy smell in your child's school, okay? And then of course, further on you can see question 25G, um, are you able to discern any leaks uh, if, and whatnot um, in and around your child's school water leaks <clears throat> that leave water marks? Um, and back to your home, question 26G, um, do you use odorous cleaning products? Um, you know those, open the bottom um, cabinet under your sink, um, is it full of chemicals, basically? And of course, um, is your school or neighborhood in question 22? Is it rural or urban? And as you can see, um, there <coughs> was, um, you know, pretty uh, constant responses. Um, but as well, we are showing you the actual response rates for those particular questions. Okay? And then, of course, um, as we introduced you to earlier, we mapped the neighborhood, went out, um, a lab group went out and did some community mapping. And as you can see here, 
we superimpose the <clears throat> toxic release inventory facilities that are present in um, the three zip codes that are shown as these red um, thumbtacks here. So you can see the toxic release inventory sites are in 37207, 37208, and 37209. Now 37209, of course, uh, 37208, of course, is the target area. This actually um, exemplifies and is the um, residential community that um, is right outside of Meharry Medical College and Nashville General Hospital. And this slide simply shows you that in that target zip code, 37208, we do in fact find um, seven or eight toxic release inventory facilities in close proximity to these residences uh, for these individuals. Here you see that um, articulated a little bit clearer for you um, and uh, clearly um, with respect to the analysis by support vector machines, um, we see here as compared to logistic regression that the SVM model um, was a little bit more sensitive in terms of sort of associating links between perceived exposure and proximity to a toxic release inventory facility. And so all in all, we see that support vector machine um, analysis is in fact shown to have discriminant power, if you will, in terms of sensitivity to um, shed light on the an association between perceived environmental exposure in those five domains relative to uh, proximity to a point source toxic release inventory facility, okay? And that's on that 54 item survey. Uh, next, I'd like to um, introduce you to the Stanbaugh Elwood community. That is one of the communities in the Southern Gateway as we spoke about um, during lecture B. So let's move right into that. <clears throat> During 2014, um, the mayor at the time here, as you can um, see then Mayor Coleman, Michael Coleman, initiated a very aggressive revitalization campaign for what is known as the Southern Gateway. Um, the Southern Gateway is right off High Street, um, down on South High Street, and extends over to Livingston, and then down to Parsons, and it's everything in between. And there are about seven um, um, neighborhoods that are they that were founded um, based upon um, the race and the culture of the particular residents in them. And so, here you have German Village, for an example. You see um, Hungarian Village, and then coming on um, up north, the Marion Village. Vasa Village, Ennis Gardens, Reeb Hosack, and then of course this um, in the dark green here, that would be Stambaugh Elwood. And that um, uh, Stambaugh Elwood is the neighborhood um, where uh, a community-based organization asked the College of Public Health at the Ohio State University to look into some of their concerns with respect to um, uh, sources of um, environmental contaminants adversely impacting their neighborhood. So we went, we went out my laboratory and we actually performed co community mapping there in um, Stanbaugh Elwood. And this is, um, you can go to this site during your spare time. This is Mapler and as you can see here, um, this is Stanbaugh Elwood in this little horseshoe. There's about 67 or 68 residences um, there. Um, and the individual, so let's see um, what the demographics of the particular area um, suggests to us. And here in this table one um, from um, one of the recent publications um, from the laboratory, we can see that uh, in zip codes 43206, 43207, and 43208, we can compare then those demographics and social determinants of health with um, uh, the baseline um, of Franklin County and then compare that to Columbus and then of course you can make further comparisons uh, within the state of Ohio and if you look at 
the middle column here, 43207, which is the zip code, that um, two of those neighborhoods in the Southern Gateway um, are, can be found in, you can just go down the right, left column there in terms of population, race and ethnicity, education, employment and income, health insurance, pregnancy and birth related outcomes, that would be adverse pregnancy outcomes, if you will, um, sexually transmitted diseases, what about the leasing causes of death in terms of all-cause mortality? Okay, um, and in almost every case, 43207, um, those numbers are higher and, and higher than the other zip codes and as well are higher than Columbus proper, um, Franklin County proper, and of course relative to the state of Ohio as well. This indicates uh, some concerns, right? And so within the context of the built natural, physical, and social environment, these individuals were wondering why they seem to be progressing from this healthy state here to a disease state. And we explained to them that there could be multiple etiologies and causes for this. Um, a particular concern to the community, though, were the fact that were, are these environmental toxicants then accelerating, perhaps, their progression from a healthy state to a disease state? We explained that, of course, you must consider your genetic individual vulnerability, um, your predisposition to other diseases, your nutritional state, of course, is very, very important, as well, um, individual behaviors, yes, individual behaviors, loom large here, of course, drugs and whatnot, that's very, very negative. They would tend to then increase your progression from a healthy to a disease state. And of course, your development and age, of course, um, when you are potentially exposed to um, any type of environmental contaminant. Uh, relevant to that discussion then would be the state of housing in the uh, Southern Gateway in a particular neighborhood. Here we've broken down the um, housing profiles for all of the um, indigenous uh, uh, communities that comprise the Southern Gateway. Hungarian Village in its gardens, Marion Village, Reeve Hosack, Standby Elwood, Vasa Village, and then of, of course the entire South Side relative to Columbus. And as you can see, all of, it, um, all of these areas tend to have um, a majority of housing units that were built pre-1940. Now what does that mean? That indicates that there was might probably um, an, an inordinate or disproportionate amount of um, lead in these homes, okay? And um, of course that isn't good at all. Um, we all know that lead is a neurotoxicant and you know there's really no safe exposure level um, to, lead, to lead. One thing that Flint, Michigan and Sebring, Ohio has taught us is that, in fact. Poverty within the Southern Gateway of communities. <clears throat> very, very, looms very large. Here you're looking at um, the percentage of poverty with respect to these individual areas. Um, you look at uh, the Stambaugh Elwood area or the Southern Gateway, if you will, in the blue bars in comparison to Columbus in the middle and of course Franklin County in the green. And in every single category, we see that the planning area or this Southern Gateway um, collection of this, the Southern Gateway community, which is comprised of all of those areas, neighborhoods that we talked about, is very, very high in poverty in comparison to Columbus proper and, of course, Franklin County. What about the infant mortality rate? The infant mortality rate um, hasn't um, gone down um, here in Franklin County, Columbus in about three or four years. As a matter of fact, it's higher. Here I'm only showing you the data from 2005 through 2010. Here we see uh, 5.8 infant deaths per 1,000 live births for Franklin County, the suburbs. The goal for Healthy People 2020 was six in terms of infant mortality. Here in Ohio, we are about at 7.8. And then the larger, um, the, the Franklin County, okay, we are at about 8.5. And then when you look at the south side, 
relative to all the communities in the South Side. And then if you look at non-Hispanic non African Americans in the South Side, we are right at about 20 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. That's just totally unacceptable. And it may be higher than that right now. This is upon recording this lecture. This is November 22nd, 2019, okay? And so I suspect we may be uh, a little higher there. When you look at maternal and child health metrics, the same sort of scenario is presented, um, relatively speaking, in terms of these graphs here. When you look at the south side relative to Franklin County, I've already showed you on the last slide, um, here you see there's still um, a disproportionate impact on the south side. This is the case whether you look at um, low birth weight, LBW, or very low birth weights, or even preterm late, preterm births, okay? It's higher in the south side than it might be uh, in Franklin County. And then when you look at late or no prenatal care for the pregnant mother versus those uh, in Franklin County, you see even a larger disparity. And of course, as is the case in all um, inner city um, areas that are socioeconomically deprived, you see that babies born to teens 17 and younger um, is, um, is, is that proportion is higher than otherwise, all right? This is all cause mortality or age adjusted death rates per 100,000 um, population, okay? For, so if we look at all cause mortality and deaths, um, yes, there's disproportionately um, higher in the south side relative to Franklin County. And then when you look at cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, accidents and injury, stroke, uh, diabetes, okay, homicide, all relatively larger and more uh, prevalent in um, the south side communities than in Franklin County as a whole. And so um, Stanball Elwood residents happened to be all African American. Um, when they came to us, um, we prepared this chart to sort of look at the demographics of the uh, seven or eight uh, neighborhoods that comprise the Southern Gateway. And um, as you can see here, um, in this particular set of bars, and we're looking at Hungarian Village in its gardens, Marion Village, Reeve Holsack, Stanbaugh, Elwood is the open square. We can see that that bar is higher, and which represents almost 50% um, of those uh, residents are in fact African American, which is higher than any of the other. <clears throat> um, the Southern Gateway neighborhoods. And so we thought then that we could use our public participatory geographical information systems tools to help these residents educate themselves about um, environmental exposures and potential exposure to environmental contaminants as a general education campaign. And, and so um, subsequent to mapping the neighborhood, um, we um, sort of set them down and taught them about this Mapler, um, this Mapler platform that we use. And we use it to collect data, as you can see here. And it helps communities engage with each other, right? And helps them understand the research that we're doing. Um, we did create a portal page for this community. That was the website and uh, homepage that I showed you earlier. And um, we've done this all across the country, okay? And so that's one of our um, sites, URLs, for Tulsa, Oklahoma, that we'll talk about here shortly. Um, and, and if you have a smartphone, um, you are able to use Mapler, as you can see here. It doesn't matter whether it's an iPhone or an Android. Um, here is the platform, of course. It's been used uh, in government um, prior to us using it. Um, here are some of the governmental agencies, the EPA, NOAA, um, the CDC, state, local agencies use um, PPGIS uh, in, in, in every day in their day-to-day -day work. Um, uh, and so our platform here is uh, Mapler X, as you can see here, and we um, community map Wyland Park. Um, as mentioned here today, we've done um, Stanbaugh Elwood in the Southern Gateway, and we are now in Mount Vernon, um, and we've done Milo Grove as well. Okay. And um, if you like 
um, to come with uh, the my lab out on one of these um, community mapping um, adventures, if you will. Um, here are the instructions. You can download um, the app and we will invite you to one of our sessions and you can participate in that. And of course, um, if you follow through, you can actually um, get your name on one of the papers um, from my laboratory. Um, we, this is just common practice um, here at The Ohio State University in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, yes, and so um, one of our collaborations is with um, NASA and their facility there in um, Huntsville, Alabama, um, the USRA, University uh, Space Resources Administration, and they have a satellite um, called the MODIS satellite, and the MODIS revolves around the Earth about uh, twice a day, and we are able and to um, uh, collaborate with uh, this particular branch of NASA towards um, um, ascertaining um, the PM 2.5 concentrations um, around the um, Earth. Um, of course, we're particularly interested in Ohio since we're here. Of course, this works in and everywhere on the Earth. And as you can see here, um, this would be the front page of the PPGIS for um, the Stanmar Elwood community. This is, you know, we are at a wide view here, but we can see the entire state of Ohio. And one thing that comes across very, very vividly is the fact that there's a gradient of PM 2.5 concentrations across the entire state of Ohio. And it seems to be concentrated very much um, from the um, Lake Erie dish, Lake Erie area all the way down through um, uh, Cincinnati with Columbus being in the middle. But our relative PM 2.5 concentrations are um, high here in um, Columbus. You can see some of the other, um, this is, yes, this is, these are active layers. We have all types of Ohio health data, like the data that I showed you in um, table one before those demographics of 432078 and 9. We also have survey data here, right? So the residents can see their own data from the, from the surveys that they took, that 54 item environmental exposure survey. As well, we have toxic release inventory data shown right here. Um, and then the PM 2.5 grid and the boundaries, as well as land use and land cover information. Very important information for residents to get when um, we are, um, when you are attempting to conduct an environmental literacy campaign. This is the satellite view from um, for Stanball Elwood showing the um, immediate area, circle here. And then as you can see, this is all of the residences uh, in Stanball Elwood on the inner horseshoe. And then around them there are, as you can see, this community is totally surrounded by 13 toxic release inventory facilities, these red dots, and in addition, um, an additional 20 or 30 additional factories, or I will say um, um, industries with smokestack emissions, all right? And um, this is very, very interesting. This is all a part of assessing um, whether a community um, is in a position to be disproportionately exposed. Uh, based on um, the results thus far, we deem Stanball Elwood a very, very unique um, community just based on the aforementioned and um, we decided to conduct um, um, this study that they requested um, between 2014 and 2016. These are the various steps um, of that study, but more importantly, um, we ask the residents to participate in a soil sampling survey, okay? Um, as you know, um, there is quite a history with respect to legacy urban soil contaminants, with lead being the principal um, culprit, if you will. And this is just showing how um, some contaminants in the environment or from smokestack emissions can end up uh, in the soil, of course. Of course, there are several matrices that they pass through, with human receptors being one of them. If you want to know more about that, 
you can take my toxicology course in, um, and it's always offered in the spring. And we get into great detail. So within um, this study, contaminant transmission uh, to and from the soil is concerned. The soil analysis provides information on various exposure pathways. If there are low levels of contaminants or metalloids in the soil, that's not really a concern, but if the levels are moderate or high, this may be cause to further evaluate the individual scenario of the community. And then if that's the case, we call this a hazard assessment, and um, that would be for the purposes of determining if there is potential risk to uh, the residents. Uh, yes, these are just some slides indicating um, how lead was um, found in the environment historically, um, particularly with regard to urban soils. Um, these are just some candid shots here. Um, you can see how um, the paint, lead, lead, because lead was present in paint, um, it was, and lead is very, very sweet. Don't ask me how I know that. But it, it presents itself as a potential um, deadly exposure, if you will, dangerous exposure to children, because children have a high level of hand-to-mouth activity, those of you um, who know about this will realize that many other regulations on lead were directed at minimizing this, this exposure to children um, by this hand-to-mouth activity, okay? And so is the soil, is the, are the soil concentrations of metalloids above the Environmental Protection Agency's RSL, or Residential Soil Screening Level? Very, very simple paradigm. If the answer is yes, then further investigation for the contaminant um, may be warranted, right? And if no, then no further investigation is possibly needed, okay? And then here uh, we are showing in this cartoon um, the pathways and, and, and how lead uh, is present in the environment. Um, and of course, with groundwater being the potential concern from soil, right? then that would then uh, be available to come into your home via the system, uh, the municipal system that we have uh, in pretty much every city in America um, to, for you to ingest it as you're drinking. But as you can see here, there can be leaching, um, further leaching into the groundwater, lead or any one of these metalloids could aerosolize and become airborne, of course, and then you'd be subject to um, the inhalation um, route of exposure as well. Then, of course, as we just talked about, one can consider themselves, in terms of these children, um, this direct ingestion, if you will, this hand-to-mouth activity when kids are outside playing um, presents a major exposure pathway as well. Well, finally, in April of 2015, we were able to um, survey 21 residences where we collected four samples per residence. This is Dr. Nicholas Bosta, who is my partner uh, here in this project and in the projects out in the community, out in Stanbaugh, Elwood. Um, you can see we collected, in the, uh, we collected at the drip line, in the front yard, at the roadside, in the backyard. Here is the, this next slide shows the random um, sample generator for the Stanbaugh, Elwood. Um, neighborhood and so clearly uh, the blue sample, the blue we label the houses that we were going to collect from here in the blue and um, the yellow and white we've not collected um, samples just yet. Here is the detailed sampling strategy for that and so we ended up with lots of um, soil to analyze in um, Dr. Bosta's laboratory. And so here are the results. These are the results for lead. And let me just orient you to this figure here. On the ordinate, we have metal concentration in milligrams per kilogram of, of soil. And on the abscissa, we have the residence, the Stanbaugh Elwood residence. And let me orient you to the reference lines in the figure. 
the common average is record is rec is is revealed by this blue dotted line here. The uh, brown line, if you will, represents background levels in Franklin County for lead. The top line represents the residential soil screening level, and the dark red line in the middle is the average of the residents in Stanbaugh Elwood. Okay, <coughs> and so. Um, as you can see, I don't know, what, about 50-50? Um, all of the residences are above the common average. All of them are above the Franklin County background. And then a few of them um, are dangerously close to the residential soil screening level, uh, um, which at the time uh, was 400 uh, micrograms per um, milligram uh, per kilogram, so 400 milligrams per kilogram lead, okay? And so um, this then rises, elicits some concern, of course. Uh, we don't want to see um, levels um, this even this close to a residential soil screening level, okay? And so we see that um, lead, in this case, in the Stanball Elwood community, is above natural background levels in most samples are in fact below the soil screening level. And, and um, you know, we uh, don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily concerned with those well below the soil screening level, but certainly there are several samples um, um, very, very close to the residential soil screening level. Now, high, higher levels of lead were in fact found around the drip line of the home. That's normal and customary. Um, and that indicates that, of course, they came from um, paint chips, okay, from, from paint chips. Lead paint, not good. Okay, here's arsenic. Arsenic concentrations are a little bit tighter. Still, we see some of the samples there, the av between the average and the resonance of soil screening level, um, and that area is known for high levels of arsenic. You all might remember the story about the park there, um, right down Parsons Avenue. So in arsenic two, the levels are above natural background. Most samples are in fact, and as you can see right here, are below the soil screening level, but still we like to sort of delve a little bit deeper into this for these residences. Thallium, um, thallium is, um, look, at the, look at the ordinate now. Um, look, that's why you have to look at your y-axis. It may appear that uh, these uh, concentrations are far apart, but as you can see here, we're looking at 0.2 um, milligrams per kilogram um, separation on increments there on the y-axis. And so um, thallium, uh, so you can see each yard is well below the soil screening level, but still, um, but thallium is a byproduct of the um, galvanization processes, industrial processes that occur in the standby Elwood area, okay? And so here are a couple of examples. Uh, we label them Company A and Company B. You can clearly see that um, Company A here, this is the toxic release inventory over a 25 year period for this particular company. And we are looking at pounds released per year for each of these compounds. And as you can see, acetone, acetonitrile, ammonia, benzene, formic acid, HCl, lead, lead compounds, methanol. Look at all of the, uh, the the um, concentrations and the individual compounds that are released from this company A. Also company B, we show here um, a particular interest were chromium, manganese, uh, molybdenum, trioxide. All of these are products of galvanization processes, if you will. I say over this 25 year period. And of course, none of you, I bet you wouldn't want to live in an area that was bombarded like this. And so at the end of the study, we were able to produce an informational card for each resident, which indicated, in fact, um, the eight metalloids uh, of interest um, that we found to be relatively high in the area and what those levels were um, relative to Franklin County, relative to Columbus, and then relative to um, uh, Ohio, if you will. Um, we told them that if they were interested in seeking further environmental, environmental literacy and learning um, who to contact, that was the College of Public Health, 
And so um, this is an example of that card um, right there. Very, very helpful to the residents. Um, and then one of the things that's particularly concerning to us uh, here in neuroscience in my lab is the proximity of um, uh, very uh, K through 12 learning centers, if you will, in um, the particular um, Southern Gateway area um, to the sources of environmental pollution. Um, we actually got a lead monitor placed at one of them that is in Stanball Elwood, and um, we actually um, were able to publish an additional paper where we use um, secondary data from the um, uh, uh, ODH, right, of the Ohio Department of Health and the United States Environmental Protection Agency to sort of correlate blood lead levels with soil levels, soil lead levels. And um, while there isn't a striking correlation that can be seen here, what is particularly concerning to me is the fact that if you look at 400 milligrams per kilogram soil lead, look at the range of concentrations that this might turn out to be in a child's blood lead levels. So if you're exposed to 400 milligrams per kilogram lead, you can potentially have a blood lead burden anywhere from 10 all the way up to 26, 27 uh, micrograms per deciliter of blood. Not good. The next step and next project, we, are, we will be looking to correlate the soil and blood lead concentrations with the Bailey Scales of Infant Development Mental Development Index. That will be on the right y-axis here. And so what we have in totality when you use the United States Environmental Protection Agency's um, EJ screen tool, which then um, compartmentalizes and calculates um, and a neighborhood's um, probability of being high risk or vulnerable. And, and, and it does this based on percentile. And as you might imagine, the zip code 43207 was above the 75th percentile in every category that's present on the EJ screen, okay? So we were very happy to report this. Um, this is, we went on NPR, explained these particular results, we actually got a monitor erected in the Stanball Elwood community, and this is under further investigation and um, analysis as we speak. Uh, now, I wanted to end on, on a high note. And so we've given you several examples of environmental injustice uh, throughout the United States, but there are good stories also. And Tulsa, Oklahoma is one of my favorite cities um, and, and to work in. And so, um, several years ago, we formed a partnership um, with Anton Harris and um, his company out there. Um, and, and at the time, um, Anton um, was attempting to uh, partner with the city toward renovating um, this particular area in North Tulsa. It's an old railway yard, as you can see here, an old railway yard. It's called a fine tube site. Just Google it, fine tube. And as you can see here, um, it's old, dilapidated, these buildings are old. But Antoine wanted to partner with the city toward generating this net sum zero um, uh, uh, emitting um, greenway, if you will. And so he asked um, the city for money to do this. He's a developer in his own right. Um, they put together this project, as you can see here. Um, Future Light Rail is going to be there coming into an area which has um, affordable housing as well as a market. And within the context of that market, um, we can address all aspects of sustainability from an urban perspective, okay? And as you can see here, um, right now they are converting these old dilapidated, um, this is an old railway processing facility where they make railway ties and railway railroad tracks, if you will. And so all of this, you can imagine all of the toxicants that are present in this area. So it was declared a brownfield, um, and then of course it's being cleaned up. And one can imagine that you can go from EJ in this scenario to Greenway to have fresh fruits and vegetables for the minority community that this 
buying two sites sits in the middle of and um, everything can turn out to be um, fine. You can take these areas of that will, used to be um, super fun sites and brownfields and convert them into green spaces, green ways, and just monuments of sustainability. And um, last but not least, um, here remember um, the exposed zone represents the totality of exposures uh, from air, water, diet, lifestyle, behavior, metabolism, inflammation, oxidative processes. And this would be the case during all, all stages of life from birth to death. And remember you heard it here at the in the College of Public Health at the Ohio State University. And so in summary, uh, we can see now that the application of our public health exposed on framework running side by side with con conventional epidemiological methodologies um, pays off. It was um, of use to the Stanbaugh Elwood community. Um, and, and so this whole exercise revealed a number of positive aspects that are listed here. Uh, we see that um, with the public health exposed zone in concert, working with local and state policymakers and agencies, um, and of course academic institutions being here at OSU, this framework can be used to effectively address problems and concerns from um, adversely impacted communities. We can also see that using the EJ screen, right, the US EPA's EJ screen, um, communities can determine whether or not they are vulnerable and high risk. We also saw that these communities, uh, these high risk communities were disproportionately impacted, right? Okay. Um, with regard to all those chronic disease outcomes that I stated earlier. We saw that the results for soil metal levels were somewhat typical of urban soils. While the eight sample metals occurred at higher levels, greater levels, than, for example, natural levels in Franklin County well, background, um, they were, for the most part, below the uh, risk-based levels from the um, uh, EPA, okay? The levels of metalloids in the residential soils warrant further action from the context and from the standpoint that there were several residences there in Stanbaugh Elwood that were right there abutting those RSLs, okay? And of course, the metals that were high are associated with galvanized um, fabrication processes, which is what the plants did, those industries do, down there in Stanbaugh Elwood. And the concentrations of lead at residences remain a concern for those particular residences and likely support that we go out there and perform a pile of hazard assessment, a full hazard assessment. And so with that, I'd like to say um, thank you very much, and um, I will see you in the next module when we will talk about environmental burden of disease. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Okay, Margaret, it's going to need editing. <laughs>